All right, here we are this morning. It's uh, September the uh, 16th, Friday. That's correct. Uh, we're at the Children's Coalition Incorporated. My name is Carlton Cartwright. I'm the CEO and founder of the Children's Coalition Incorporated, and we're here this morning with Leonard Meltzer. Leonard, um, what is your birthday? Uh, August 21st, 1922. Okay, and um, where do you live now, presently? I live in Jupiter, 6535 North Chasewood Drive, Apartment F, Jupiter, Florida. Okay, and you and I met at the um, XPOW uh, gathering last week at the VA hospital. That's correct. Okay, what, what branch of service were you in? I was in the infantry in the Army. What war did you serve in? World War II. And what was what was your rank, Leonard? Staff Sergeant. Oh, oh really? Okay. And where did you serve? I served in Europe. Where? Exactly. We went in Omaha Beach. We went across France. Uh, and we hit the Moselle River, which was uh, near the dividing line, Alsace-Lorraine, between France and Germany. Uh, the river was flooded. It rained for a week. We crossed the river and uh, we we dug in across the river, and uh, the river f flooded, and we were stuck in the water for four days. The Germans kept hitting us with the artillery, with the 88s, and uh, finally on the third on the fourth night, we uh, there were seven of us. We waded into the deep water and we found a, a barn up on a hill. And when we found the barn up on the hill, we, the artillery started hitting the barn, but we were in the other corner so we didn't get hurt. But by that time, I had what they called a severe case of trench foot. We all did. Right. Shall I continue? Yes, sir. Go ahead. Not a problem. And uh, my feet were very bad shape. They were swelled. They were swollen uh, twice the size, and they were black and blue, and they were very painful. And in the morning, we heard uh, Germans outside the barn. There must have been 70, 80 Germans. There were seven of us. We were all in bad shape. And uh, they came in, and luckily I could speak some German, not very well, but I. And uh, being Jewish, I knew I was in trouble. So I took my dog tags, which had an H on it, and buried them in the sand right there in the barn. Uh, they took us prisoner, uh, they put us in a truck, and uh, our own planes came over and started to strafe the, the, the truck. We jumped, we couldn't get out, but they jumped in a ditch. Luckily, none of us got hurt. And they took us to a uh, German hospital, not too far from where we were. And uh, when we got to the German hospital, we just laid there on the ground, on, on the floor. They gave us no treatment. And uh, a nurse came in, saw us laying there, and she, we all had a beard we hadn't shaved in a long time. And the nurse said to me in German, Schönes Amerikaner, which means you're a good looking American. And she gave me an apple to eat. And she said, Shh, don't, not, don't tell anybody, she said in German. So thank God. So I shared it with another person with, with me. Then the colonel, the German colonel came in and we were laying there and he said, we must have some information. So I said, all I can give you is my name, rank and serial number. Well, he kept insisting I give information, and I said, oh, your name, rank, and serial number is all we can give you. And uh, he said to the lieutenant, Aufschneiden, which meant cut, it, cut, cut their feet off. Well, I was sweating bullets. So how it came to me, I don't know. I was young, and, and I said to him, in German, I said, I could speak a little German, I took it in school and everything. I said, Ich bin ein Deutsch, which means I am a German. He said, Warum, which means how, why. And I told him my mother and father came from Hamburg, Germany. So
So he kept looking at me and looking at me and looking at me, and finally he said in German, er hat blaue Augen, which means he has blue eyes, he is a German. Nicht aufschneiden, don't cut his feet off. Well, <laughs> I was scared. I bet. <laughs> I was sweating, I'll tell you. I'm telling. Well, anyway, uh, they, took, they took three of the guys away that were with me, and I think they cut their feet off. I'm not sure, but I can't. I can't say yet what they did. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But anyway, the next day they put us on a German troop train, all German wounded, and they were taking us to a prison camp, which was in Ludwigsburg near Stuttgart. We didn't know where we were going. And suddenly, uh, planes came over and started to strafe the, the the train that we were in with all German. They had men in there with no legs, no arms, uh, you know going back to a big field hospital for the Germans. Mm -hmm. And the commandant from the plane, from the, from the troop train, he, he um, came up to me and he said uh, in German, are you a flyer? I said, no, I'm infantry, I'm a foot soldier. Oh, foot soldiers are good, he says, but they are the devils. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, we finally got to, the, to our destination, which was the our prison camp, but we had to walk seven miles, and my feet were the pain. The, the pain was unbearable. Uh -huh. And uh, instead of having the regular German uh, soldiers marches to the prison camp, they had the uh, Hitler Youth, kids 13, 14, and they all had guns and they had whips. And if we didn't stay in line, they would they would stroke you. Uh -huh. So we finally got to the prison camp, and uh, we stayed there for, uh, I didn't walk for over two months. My feet were unbearably painful. No, no treatment, no nothing. And uh, then they put us, we were there for about two and a half months. They put us on a boxcar for four days, and they locked us in, 50 in a boxcar. It was January by that time, utterly cold. And uh, they gave us a half a loaf of bread, and for water they would throw in snow. And we we went up near Poland somewhere. I don't know. I can't tell you the name of the prison camp. Mm -hmm. We were there for maybe two weeks, and the Russians started coming, so they didn't want us to be liberated. We didn't want to be liberated by the Russians anyway, because a lot of the men who were liberated by the Russians were taken back to Russia and used as slave labor. Oh, great! American people don't know that. Uh -huh. We have 80,000 men missing from World War II Jeez. that people don't even know. That's, in, the, that's in, the, in statistics. But anyway, then they marched us from that camp 170 miles in the snow to our third prison camp, which was on Magdeburg on the Elbe River. And by that time, we were, we were really in rough shape. I developed hepatitis. I had a ruptured eardrum, which I had all the way. My feet were still hurting me bad, and uh, it was last, it was around April when the American forces reached the Elbe River on this side, mm -hmm. and we were here, but the American forces couldn't cross over to liberate us because the Russians were giving that territory. When, when Roosevelt had the peace treaty with, with Stalin, who should get what area? Mm -hmm. So for a month we practically had nothing to eat, and I was very sick among all the other men. And uh, finally the Russians gave him the right to cross over and liberate. Well, there were Americans, there were, there were English, there were uh, Australians, there were Polish. There was probably 30,000 men in, in this prison camp, all in rough shape. <laughs> so when, when the tank man came into my barracks, I weighed 102. And he said, who's in charge of this barracks? And I said, I am. And the reason I was because I could speak some German. And mm -hmm. Anyway, so I said, I am. And I said, looked at him and I said, he was a big fat colonel. <laughs> and I said, I said, you big fat son of a bitch. I said to him, it's about time you guys showed up. Oh, he, I'll never forget this. This sticks in my head. And he laughed, he said. Give these men some food, he said to the lieutenant. So they went out and got a C ration. We took two, three bites. Couldn't eat our stomach. Yeah, no. 
And I, I was very sick that day. I had a 103 temperature. I had, I, I had pneumonia already. Mm -hmm. So they took us back to, uh, they took me, they went to Lucky Strike, which is a big camp where every, all the ex POWs were displaced persons. Yeah. And when the medic saw me how I was, they ran me down to Reims, France, which uh, the, Germ the, the Americans had taken over the hospital. Mm -hmm. And uh, I've never, I'll never forget, they gave me at least 20 pills. They gave me a shower and they deloused me. And I slept for probably two days. I, uh, and I was there for six weeks in, this, in Reims, France hospital. And then they put us on a stretcher and they, they flew us back from France to Fort Dix to a hospital. Oh, in, in New Jersey, yeah. In New Jersey, yeah. And then I was in the hospital there for about a couple of weeks, and I don't know why, they transferred me to Camp Pickett, Virginia, mm -hmm. to a hospital. And uh, although I was in the hospital seven months, uh, after the three, three months, then I was feeling better already, you know. Right. So they finally gave me a furlough. Uh -huh. They still kept me until another three, four months until I got real well, right, <laughs> and then it took me a, took me a couple of years to really, because my what had happened with the hepatitis was my liver swelled up, mm -hmm. and uh, they were very concerned about that, and uh, it took a couple of years for me to get better, mm -hmm. and uh, I must say that. Uh, even though combat was bad, but prison camp was unbearable. Mm -hmm. It was an experience that I would never want anyone to go through because not only, not only was it physically bad, but you see with the Germans, the brainwash, they would come into the camp, for instance, and say, well, Ten German planes knocked down a hundred American planes and so and so. Or we bombed New York yesterday. And men that didn't understand, after you hear it over and over again, there were some men who believed it. Mm -hmm. And uh, we lost, I lost, on the march, we lost a number of men who just couldn't make the march. They even had police dogs on the march from the second to the third camp. Yeah. Who would who were ordered to attack the men who fell out. That's a that's and the American people don't have no idea what 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 American what, what POWs went through. You know what I mean? They can't because basically American people are Nice people, you know, the majority are nice people. And they can't, they can't accept the fact that there are mean people in the world, mm -hmm. like the Germans were, or the Japanese who were worse, or today Al-Qaeda Al or the Taliban, what we're fighting today. Right. And that's, so, basically, that's my story. Um, I'm just going to go back. Uh, Any, anything else you want to know? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah, you're just getting a little started here. Okay. Were you drafted or were you enlisted? Well, I'll explain to you that situation. Mm -hmm. When I was 16, 17, I had a severe infection in my nose. Mm -hmm. What they had to do, I was very sick, they had to take the septum out, which is, which holds the nose up, and they, they sloughed it out, which left my nose like a fighter. I had a pug nose. So when I went to go in the army, they wouldn't take me mm -hmm. because I couldn't breathe. My I was just shut down. So I persuaded my mother and father to take me. I wanted to go in badly because everybody was going. So I, from Syracuse, I went to New York to a plastic surgeon, and he he did plastic surgery on my nose and put in a piece of something in here to build it up so I could breathe. Yeah. And then after I had that done, within two weeks, I went back and they took me in the service. Oh, okay. That's the way I went in. Otherwise, they wouldn't have taken me. 
Right. And uh, it was a different world then, Carlton, because people were patriotic, you know, they loved the country. Right. So I just couldn't, and at that time I had already gone to university for one year. Mm -hmm. I went to Syracuse, mm -hmm. and I was in ROTC, oh. and I could have stayed out, uh -huh. but I just couldn't, mentally I couldn't stay out. I just wanted to go badly because right. everybody was going in. When I came back from the war, there was a GI Bill, they tried to go back to the university, and I couldn't read a book. I, I, I went back too quickly. My mind was all clogged up with what had happened in the last right. years. So I, I never, so I never finished college. Hmm. And uh, as far as, so that's what happened as far as me going in and out of the service. Anything else? Yeah, yeah. We, this, I got to, just to take you back through. No, go ahead. Some, uh, yeah. Um, uh, at the time of your, your your enlistment, where were you living in in Syracuse? Syracuse. Yeah. Okay. Uh -huh. yeah, yeah. Well, and I already I think I know why you joined because you yeah. felt the obligation and the need to go. That's correct. Okay. And why did you pick that service branch? I didn't pick it. Oh. I went. Uh, you have a choice. At, at the time, you had no choice. You can go in the navy if you wanted to. No. At no? the time, you had no choice. Really. Uh, okay. They, they I, were... I chose the army uh -huh. as far as the army goes. Yeah. But. What, what branch of the service, you had no choice to, to go to. In other words, I couldn't say I want to go to the Air Force, I want to go infantry, I want to go, I want to go quartermaster, or whatever it may be. They put you where they wanted you to be? Yeah, they had a field, Niagara Falls was the uh, induction center, uh -huh. and uh, if they needed uh, 2,000 men for infantry to go to where I went to Fort McClellan, yeah. that's where I went. Okay. So that's where I was sent. I got you, all right. So you recall your first days in service, what was boot camp like? Where'd you go to boot camp? Fort McClellan. Okay, and, and what was that like? Well, it was infantry training. Uh, it was it was tough. It was good. That uh, I'd never been away from home, mm -hmm. <laughs> and being Jewish, I had never had a piece of meat out of uh, whether you understand what I'm saying. Yeah. Uh, you eat kosher meat. Right. I had never saw bacon in my life. I never saw ham. You know what I mean? Yeah. So it was all different to me. Uh -huh. But it came to the point where I, I ate whatever they whatever they had. You adjusted. You know? Yeah. Gotcha. So I grew uh, up in New York. Huh? I grew up in New York. New York City. I know City? what you're talking about. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um. So, uh, what was your MOS? What was your What was your job in the service? I mean, after after I left, after I went overseas. Yeah. Basic training. Went to basic training. Uh, Did you go to any technical school or anything or any? No. Training, just no. weapons or? No. Well, weapons, we, we all learned with uh, the, M the uh, M1, the uh, 30 caliber machine gun, the 50 caliber, uh, the grenade, you know, uh, as far as that goes. But we had never special training. Gotcha. That was in the basic training. We learned all that. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, obviously, you saw combat. That's correct. Uh, were there a lot of casualties in your unit? Yes. Especially when we crossed the river. Mm -hmm. See, what happened... How large was your unit or your battalion? Or? How big was it? Yeah. How many men? Well, there's, there's, a, there's a company of 200 men approximately. Okay. Uh, the platoon is around 40 men, 40, 42 men. Mm -hmm. And uh, as you go up, the, the regiment is uh, 3,000, the battalion is 1,000. So you're a part of each unit. You understand what I'm yeah, saying? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I was a part of a company right. that belonged to the division. That's, and that was a couple of hundred men. Yeah. So that's what that was all about. Did you get any, any awards or medals or citations? I got two Purple Hearts. Mm -hmm. I got the Bronze Star. Okay. And uh, other medals that, uh, that are significant, you know what I mean? Right. Yeah. What did you get the Bronze Star for? Well... <laughs> I'd rather not. You don't have to, but just I'd well, like for you to tell me. But well, this this, this guy was was hit, and I have. I don't I don't like to brag or nothing like that. But I the guy was hit, and uh, I happened to drag him out from an area where things were tough. Right. And 
and I got the bronze star for that. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I would just, it's part of the story. I understand. I, understand. I, I understand. Appreciate your modesty. Okay. It's part no, of, no just problem. trying to get the information. Yeah. And so you got the two purple hearts. What for your? I got a purple. I got wounded in the side. Right. And I had my feet uh, from the French foot. They gave me a purple heart for that. Gotcha. All right. All right. Were you able to stay with, in touch with your family before after the capture, you know, while you had the entire military service? Well, let me explain that situation. Okay. After I was captured, uh, uh, my, mother and, my mother and father received a telegram saying, missing in action. Right. Well, we were allowed to send uh, uh, letters from prison camp, mm -hmm. but the Germans never sent them out. Uh-huh. So it was, it was at least four months that I was missing in action when finally one of the letters that I wrote came through to them. But for four months or so, my parents did not know if I was dead or alive. Right. I'll just tell you a funny thing. Well, that, I didn't see my mother for, for uh, over, a, oh, over a year, a year and a half, you know, whatever it was. And finally, when I did come home on a furlough, mm -hmm. you know, and uh, I walked into the house and she saw me, you think she'd come over and start hugging me and yeah. being, a, but being a Jewish mother, yeah. she looked at me and she said, look what you did to me, she said, you made me worry all this time, uh -huh. like it was my fault. Yeah. She put the guilt on, on the guilt trip on me. Yeah. <laughs> Not, <laughs> how long is it take you to explain that? <laughs> I said, I'm sorry. Yeah. It was my fault I said that. Yeah, oh boy. And I'll never forget that. Yeah. Oh, God. It was funny. But Did you ever explain to her what happened? Huh? Did you ever explain to her? I tried to, but let me explain to you. My mother and father came from the old country. I understand. When they came here, they didn't have 10 cents in their pocket. Right. They came to Ellis Island. They came in legally. Right. You know, my father got a job for three bucks a week uh -huh. up in Syracuse where his brothers were. And uh, up to the time he died, if you said buy something on credit with it, you know, he would never buy. Yeah. He wouldn't buy a 10 cent stamp right. unless he could pay for it. Yeah. That's the way they were. <coughs> Their way to the highway, right? He was as honest as the day is long, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and if he had the money and he could buy a car, he'd save up. Of course, cars didn't cost what they did today. Right. But he wouldn't buy nothing. On credit, yeah. No, because, and he loved this country more than people that were born here. Mm -hmm. Because he came from where they lived in, he came from Lithuania. Uh -huh. They had nothing, uh -huh. the clay full of floors, you know. And uh, my mother's my mother's uh, mother, they lived, uh, when she was small, they used to have in gangs go out and say, let's kill some Jews. Mm -hmm. And they came right to her house and they killed her mother right in front of her. Oh, God. Yeah. You know? And, uh, I mean, minorities, even in this country, you know, you're being black, uh -huh. me being Jewish, mm -hmm. even going back in the 30s and 40s, right? even Jews were discriminated against. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, I know. Hotels uh, made no difference, the same as, as in your race. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people don't know that either. Mm -hmm. uh, Arthur Godfrey, if you, know, if you remember him. He oh, was, yeah. He had a hotel in Miami Beach. Uh -huh. No Jews allowed. Really? That's correct. But anyway, we don't, we're getting off the track. That's okay. So, <laughs> okay. Um, how did you manage? There's several questions here, but I'm just gonna I'm gonna sum them all up into one. Go ahead. And at the end of the day, um, you, obviously you couldn't stand such with your family. You already told me what the food was like. I would imagine you ate fairly well before and after being a POW. Take that well, for granted. we didn't eat well in combat. We ate sea rations and K rations. Yeah, well. well we ate. Anyway. Yeah, yeah. I, uh, whatever we ate. I know about sea rations and K rations. I, I bet you do. I got you. <laughs> okay. Uh, 
Is how did you handle the stress? Because obviously, in extremely stressful situation, that's well, clear. So how did you handle it? Well, let me explain to you. Mm -hmm. uh, when the Germans would come into our barracks and give us the bread in the morning, they would throw the bread on the floor. Uh -huh. The bread was, they put sawdust in the bread. What was that all about? That's the fifth time I've heard that. They put sawdust or, or wood chips in the bread purposely because they wanted you to get the dysentery. They wanted you to get it. Uh -huh. And if you didn't eat it, you, you, you were starved. Yeah. So why they did it, that's the reason they did it. They wanted you to die. So they would throw the bread on the floor, black bread. I would cut the bread. Each man would get a couple slices of bread for the day. But, but you couldn't cut the bread evenly to the, to the exact minute. Yeah. So we had a deck of cards. And whoever drew the highest ace to begin with could pick out any two slices they want. Yeah. This, was a, this was a thing we went through in the morning. Yeah, a ritual. A ritual. Yeah. Then, then the second meal was uh, in, the, in the lunchtime, uh -huh. whenever it may be. They would come in with a cask of uh, what they called soup. Well, the soup was water, grass, maybe some old carrots or old turnips or old potatoes. Yeah. And we had like uh, coffee cans for our, what they call it, to get the soup in. The bowl. The yeah. bowl, whatever. Right. And we would all get, take out of the soup. Mm -hmm. That was I called soup. As far as the, what was the, the vegetables, whatever they called it, uh, the old rotten stuff, I cut it in pieces. And then again, we'd go through the ritual of picking the pieces. And that was our meal for the day. Right. That was it. No more. No salmon, no fruit, no vegetables. No dessert. No, 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 uh, no uh, Red Cross packages. Never got a Red Cross package in our life. Right. So anyway, as far as stress goes, it was stressful. It was very stressful. But I always lived my life that I would come out of it all right. Mm -hmm. I always felt that I would make it. And I was very sick. Uh -huh. Very sick. My feet were killing me. I came down with that yellow jaundice, the hepatitis. It was, it was, it was bad. But, yeah. But I, I, I always felt that I was going to make it. Right. I had guys that felt they weren't going to make it, and they, and they died. Uh huh. I had men that weighed eighty pounds. Between you and I, because they had the dysentery day and night. Yeah. And that's about how it was with me. Now, how uh, other men. Uh, you know, we're all different. Everybody's a different nature. We all look at life differently. And and I'm still, I'm 89 now, and I I know I got problems with this, with my order and everything, and mm -hmm. uh, I got other problems from the war. And uh, some people say I'm a little nuts, which I am, <laughs> because I got that PTSD, whatever you call it. Right. And, and I do get emotional. But I still, I still feel that I got a purpose in life. Right. That's the way. That's the way it is with me. Right. I understand. Um, you ever see any entertainers while you were in the service at all? Entertainers. Yeah, they. You know. Not that I can recall. Except some people did. Some people did. Overseas or in the States? I take your pick. I don't care. Well, Anytime. in the States, I saw one entertainer. I can't think of his name. He was a blind piano player. He was he sang a little, but I can't think of it. That's the only one I ever saw. Gotcha. No. Is it Ray Charles? No. If it was, I remember him. I loved, okay. I loved Ray Charles. Gotcha. <laughs> I could listen to him all day. I hear you. I can't watch him. You know, I can't watch him when he keeps rocking, but I could listen to him. I could listen to him on the radio day and night. I gotcha. Mean, I loved his. I loved his songs. Um, when you got to go on leave, how long were you in the service? Two years. Three years. Three years. Yeah. So you you were in PLW for four months. Oh no. Uh, from uh, let's see, eight months, seven eight. and a half, eight months. Yeah. All right. So before and after that time, did you get to go on leave? When you were just you know. 
Oh, you mean, you mean before I went overseas? Before you went overseas, after you got overseas, or you oh, know, did you oh, go on once, leave? Once anywhere? I was overseas, there was no leave. Okay. Once I was in the states, I had uh, probably had three furloughs. Where'd you go? Just home? Or? Well, I went home. Yeah. Uh -huh. And then uh, on on weekends, when I when we were stationed like in uh, in uh, Indian Town Gap, Pennsylvania, mm -hmm. uh, I had a I had a very close friend of mine who got killed when we crossed the river. He was my best friend, and I miss him terribly. Uh -huh. And uh, we used to go to, uh, we were like, we were near Harrisburg, and we'd, we'd go down to York, Pennsylvania. We'd go to, uh, you know, on a little, for the weekend. We'd take, uh, and went to Philadelphia a couple times. Oh, the only other thing about my service, I'll tell you one more story. Uh, when I was in McClellan, uh, they had a program called the ASTAP program. Uh -huh. I don't know if you ever heard of it or not. No. So you had to take a test to see if you were eligible. So that, so I wanted so I said I'll 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 see if I can get into that program. So I went to the University of Alabama, which was in uh, Tuscaloosa. I don't know. I think okay. it was. Anyway, took the test. I passed it. And uh, they sent me. Uh, we're going to go to college. Uh huh. To become an engineer or an officer. So they sent me to Manhattan College in New York City. And I was there for about uh, five, six days. Didn't learn anything, didn't teach anything. I was going to New York, having a hell of a time. And then I, then they sent me to uh, Philadelphia, University of Pennsylvania. Uh -huh. And I was there for about two weeks, having a hell of a time, no class, maybe classes two hours a day, going out. Uh, you know, having fun, I was young, doing my thing. Right. And finally, uh, after about a month, they discontinued the program. Right. I went right back to uh, McClellan. <laughs> but for four, three, four weeks, I had a ball. You had a great time. Yeah. No, I just want to tell you that. Okay. Um, in your, in, during your service career, you remember uh, anything particularly humorous, or any unusual events? Humorous, mm -hmm. yeah. Well, I always, I always like to have fun, especially with this friend of mine who got killed. Right. You know, we. <laughs> well, once <laughs> we were we were in Harrisburg and we were on a pass. Pennsylvania was a blue state at the time. You couldn't get a drink. You couldn't. Uh, you could, there was no movies on Sunday. Right. Everything was dead, dead closed on Sunday. Okay. So uh, we used to go down by the river. That's where all the girls were walking around, you know, looking. <laughs> you know, I said, I'll never forget this. I said, to, his name was Leonard Brack. He was from Kansas. I said, uh, we'll go down to, uh, let's go down and walk around. Let's see how many women we can meet in one day. Mm -hmm. Now we're going to wind up with them. We're just, so <laughs> we met about seven different couples of women, you know, and they thought that we were going to be picked up. We okay, nice to know you, know. So we had a little fun, <laughs> and we just did that. Right. And then we went over across the across the river. It was a small town. I can't think of the name of it. There was a lot of Polish people there, uh -huh. and they used to have uh, uh, polka dances and give you all the beer you could drink. Right. And we go, we go over there on Sunday, you know, because it was like a private uh, club. Yeah. And we we did have a hell of a time there. And uh, the other humorous thing I can tell you is, when I was stationed there, we met these two girls in the USO uh -huh. in a little town called Lebanon, Pennsylvania. Right. And uh, they lived out in the country, and they had a car, and we, and I went into the house with, with one girl. Right. He went into the house with her neighbor next door, the, my friend. Uh huh. Now here I'm on the couch with her, trying to make out a little bit, you know. Right. And all of a sudden I hear footsteps coming down, coming down, it was her father. Uh-huh. Well, in the back of the house, I didn't know that, he was a funeral director. Oh. <laughs> and the funeral was, and here's a big man, six foot four. Yeah. And there, I'm going like this. Yeah. Then he, he had a hand as big as a ham. I bet. When he shook hands with me, I thought he was going to break my hand. You know, she introduced me, and I said, "Well, I better get out of here." I said, "I said we'll get together sometime again, you know." And 
and it was dead, it was black as pitch outside, it was in a country road. Right. Now my friend's in the other place, he's having a good time, you know, <laughs> and I'm waiting outside right. in the dark. Yeah. I waited about an hour, an hour and a half, I was standing there like a dummy. Yeah. And finally he came out, and now we, now we're waiting for a ride, he's hitching this way up. <laughs> so that was humorous, that right. was fun. Mm -hmm. But that's the way we, you know, we had a little fun. So. Okay. Okay. Um, what did you think of officers and your fellow soldiers? Every one of them was first class to me except one. Mm -hmm. And he didn't like Jews. Okay. And when I first got to the company, to the division, he, he gave me a hard time. So that's one man I really, I hate to say the word hate, but I really hated the man. I hate you. And uh, he got killed. Mm. And when he got killed, I kicked him in the ribs. That's the way I felt. I hate and I shouldn't have done that, but I did. And I'll never forget that. But he was a son of a bitch. Excuse I my hate language. You. Anyway, so that's, but the majority, they were the nicest people you could meet. The fact is, our, the medic who was in our company, uh -huh. now he was a medic, Yeah, he won the Silver Star uh -huh. for, for all the aid that he gave to men who were wounded. Right. And that's quite a thing for a medic to win a Silver Star. Mm -hmm. And I really respect that guy. Right. Yeah. Now, uh, <laughs> there was a guy in prison camp with me, his name was Shorty Ganya. Mm -hmm. and there's another thing I didn't tell you about prison camp. Uh, and what they gave us to eat was hard to exist. Right. So if you came into prison camp and you had a, a watch or a ring and you were hungry when you first came in, you know, because you'd been marching and everything. Right. We never ate all our food, even though we had very meager food. I'd give you like a slice and a half of bread, which I would save up, and you'd give me, say, three cigarettes. Yeah. You understand? Yeah. And then we would crawl under the fence, because if the Germans caught us, they would. The Polish and the French worked on the farms, and they had bread and they had potatoes. And we would, like for two or three cigarettes, we would get a loaf of bread and maybe five potatoes. Oh, okay. Or maybe maybe ten. Yeah. And then Shorty Ganya, who would who, 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 he'd he'd prepare the food, potatoes and bread, you know, for me and my buddy Bernie. Bernie was my close friend. Yeah. And uh, he came in later, and uh, I never knew what happened to Shorty Ganya, but my daughter, who was very good on the internet, she found out he was from Connecticut. She traced him down. And he died in 1992. Oh. And she just got me that information about six months ago. Wow. And even a picture from his relatives. Right. And that was great to know because, I mean, I hate, but he was a nice, nice guy. Right. And uh, that's the way we, that's about the way we existed, you know. But, and then once I played, <laughs> there was a guy from Philadelphia, and uh, he, somehow he wound up with a piece of honey cake. Right. And I had three slices of bread, me and my partner, me and my Bernie was my partner. Mm -hmm. I said, I'll play, I'll give you the three slices of bread towards your honey cake. We'll play a game of casino, which was 21 points. Mm -hmm. And the whole barracks watched us, and I beat them 21 to 19. Right. But then I shared the cake with my, with my buddy. Uh -huh. I mean, it was, it was, it was crazy, but that's the way we lived. And, right. yeah. and when you look back at it, it's, it's, people say, it can't happen, but that's the way it is. That's the way we That's how it was. Yeah. Do you recall the day that your service ended? I was released from the hospital. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I recall it very, yeah. It was around the 1st of January, 2nd of January of 46. Mm -hmm. And uh, they said, they told me a week ahead of time that I was going to be. And I remember I had a lot of money coming. I mean, at that, to me, it was a lot of money. Right. For all my prisoner of war uh, uh, 
Let me explain to you. Yeah. Uh, when we went in the Army, we got 50 bucks a month. And they took off 650 for insurance. Okay. So I left you 43. But then, when overseas, when I was a sergeant, I got 110 bucks a month. But when being in combat, they give you an extra 10 bucks a month. Uh -huh. I remember that like today. So it's 120. Right. So when I got finally liberated, I mean, when I got my money all at one package, I had 1,400 and some dollars in cash. Right. So I came and I got out of, and there was nothing that I got. Yeah, I was, thank God I was getting home, coming home. When I came home, I bought a new car. All the money I had bought me a new Oldsmobile. Right. And I'll never forget that. A new 88 Olds. Uh huh. And today, the same, they don't even make Olds anymore. Right. But today, a similar car would run 22, 24 grand. Yeah. 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 And uh, then I was in rough shape mm -hmm. when I came home. And I had an uncle who lived in Miami Beach. And he rented out a big house that he had. He had six bedrooms. Right. So people would rent the bedroom out for the season, you know? Uh-huh. So they had what they called the 5220 Club. I don't know if you know what that was. I heard of it. The veterans, the veterans, if you didn't work, if you couldn't work, you'd get 20 bucks a week right. for 52 weeks. Right. So I was getting the 50, 20 bucks a week. My uncle, who he was, he was a, <laughs> anyway, he was something. He, so I said, can I stay here, Uncle? He said, yes. He says, I'll give you a room in the attic with a fan. Mm -hmm. You give me the 20 bucks a week, he says, that you get from the government. And I'll give you toast and coffee every day mm -hmm. for breakfast. But on Saturday, he says, I'll give you two eggs. <laughs> that was my uncle. Right. <laughs> so, so I stayed there for about uh, four months. Uh -huh. I was really in rough shape, I mean, physically. Yeah. I was regaining my, but every day I used to go out on what they call South Beach today. Yeah. I'd go on a beach and I, I was regaining my strength, you know. Right. But like I say, my liver was still swelled up and I wasn't in good shape. Uh huh. But uh, eventually, I, I stayed there four months and uh, it was great. I mean, I really enjoyed myself. So that was that, as far as coming back. Well, so you, you didn't use your GI Bill for school? I tried to. But okay. I, I, I tried. I, I went back to the university I, for about a month, and I, I couldn't read a book. I couldn't. My, I was all. I should have waited. Because between you and I, uh -huh. I always had in my life that I, I wanted to be an attorney. Oh. I wanted to be a lawyer. Mm -hmm. Don't ask me why. Right. But it never worked out. Okay. Um, just a few more questions. Go ahead. Um, did you maintain any of your close friendships at all over the years? From the from the service? Yeah. Yes. Uh, Bernie, who was a prisoner of war with me, mm -hmm. I'll explain that situation to you. I had been a POW about two and a half months. I was just starting to walk again a little bit, you know, mm -hmm. better. And I mean, I was walking, but I, I paint, but I, I mean, to the extent where I could walk. Yeah. And uh, he came in. He was from Brooklyn. And uh, it was a. He was Jewish. And he was a little bit arrogant. And right away, when as soon as he came in, he says, "Who's in charge of this barracks?" You know, he's wondering. So I saw the I saw the kind of guy he was, you understand? Mm -hmm. So I says, Come here. I says, as long as they put me in charge of this barracks, he said I said to him, You do as I say, or else you're gonna wind up in, in bad shape. You're gonna get hurt. And I was laying it on him pretty good, you know. And I was just a kid, you know. He, yeah. In fact he was five years older than me. But anyway, he was no dummy. He said, if I can't beat him, I'll join him, you know. <laughs> so he became my partner. Right. He became the best of friends. Okay. And right through the years, until he died about seven, eight, nine years ago, Right. Uh, we were very close. Gotcha. And then there was a couple other guys that were... Well, I'll tell you one more story. I had a guy in my barracks, and, 
and uh, he was always complaining the bread wasn't cut right, this mm -hmm. isn't right. Right. And he was always never happy. Uh huh. So it reached a point between you and I where I couldn't handle it any longer. So I got so angry, I got so mad. I grabbed him like this. I had the knife that I cut the bread with. I said, one more word and you, I will cut your throat wide open. I just, I mean, I'm sorry, but... So Bernie and two other guys grabbed me and said, Lenny, he said, God forbid, if anything like this happens, he said, we're all going to be in trouble. <laughs> so I dropped it. Now here's the, here's the payoff of the story. Uh -huh. Three years, two, two, three years later, I'm in New York City. Yeah. I'm walking down Broadway. Yeah. I'm walking down Broadway and this guy approaches me. Yeah. Oh, he says, Meltzer, he says, glad to see you. He says, come on, I'll buy you a drink. You know? Yeah. I said, you son of a bitch. <laughs> I took my hand. I, 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 oh, I shouldn't have done it, but I, I couldn't forget that guy. Uh -huh. And that was it. That was the end of that. That was the end of that. Anyway, so that's the story about it. What did you do for a career after the, after the service? Okay. Eventually. Well, I tried to go back to college. Okay. My father came from the old country, I told you. He mm -hmm. was a cattle dealer. In other words, he bought cows. He had a truck. Yeah. We'd go out and buy cows. There was a lot of dairy cows in there at where we live, you know? Uh huh. And when a cow doesn't give milk anymore, she gets hurt, they sell it for beef. Yeah. Because it's no good to the farmer. Right. So after two years and I started to regain my health. Yeah. I bought a truck. Keep going. Okay. I'm just going to turn the air down. Go ahead. Okay. Keep going. I bought a truck and uh, I went into the I went into the business myself. Right. And uh, go ahead. It was a hard it was a hard business. You had to you had to know what a cow weighed and you had to understand how to how much money you could get for and you had to, you had to barter with the with the farmer to buy the cows. You know. And I built up a, an area where I, where people believed in me, and I finally, I did this for about 35 years or more, and that's what I did, and, uh, but, it, but I had a very hard time in the winter because my feet, even though I was when I'd be outside working, uh -huh. my feet would hurt so bad when I'd come home because even though they were better, I still didn't have the circulation because they were once been frozen with the, with the trench feet. My feet hurt me for, even if I took my shoes off now with the air conditioner, my feet would hurt like crazy. Right. So, but I was in that business for years. And then uh, after that, I met a, I met a gentleman who had kiosks, if you know what the kiosk is. Yeah. So at Christmas time, he would sell, he would sell these pillows that had batteries in them, mm -hmm. and you would press on them, and they would so relieve your pain, whatever. Okay. Anyway, so he asked me if I would manage a kiosk for him in Syracuse. So he offered me a, a nice, I don't know, a nice amount of money for two months. Right. And for 10 or 11 years, I worked with him uh, doing this in different cities. Okay. Christmas time. Right. After I after I quit my cow business. Uh huh. And uh, I did that for about maybe eleven years. So I went to uh, I went to Connecticut three times. I went to Binghamton, New York. I went I went to New Jersey, and he would pay all my expenses and give me so much a week. Right. And. Uh, and the funny part of it is, he had 12 kiosks places all over the United States. Uh -huh. Now he's living in Sarasota, and twice a year, he comes over this way, and he takes my wife and I out to dinner, because we're still very close friends. Okay. So I respect that. It's very nice of him. He's a very nice guy. Okay. So that's what I did, basically. I was okay. in the cow business, and uh, I worked in that business okay. for a while. Did your military experience influence your thinking about war or about the military in general? Yes. Yes, it did. Because I, I, I look at the war today 
I was with General Patton, Third Army. Mm -hmm. General Patton said, if you don't win a war, you shouldn't go to war. Winning is the important thing. And I don't understand, we're, we're in Afghanistan now for 10 years. We have tanks, we have planes, we're fighting a ragtag army with half their faces covered. You mean to say we can't defeat them in a war? It's a different, we're living in a different social context today because since World War II, we've never won a war. Korea was a stalemate. Vietnam was, was a defeat. This war, we can't win the war because we're afraid to kill civilians. I don't say we, got, we should kill civilians, but if you can't do what you got to do, get out. That's my opinion of war. Okay. And to understand the president who says, well, we're going to leave on a certain date, how do you tell an enemy you're going to leave on a certain date? All they got to do is wait for you to leave, and then, I mean, it don't make sense to me. Right. Uh, I just don't understand it. Right. So, in my opinion, once I've been in the military, and, when I, and I was in combat, and I was POW and everything, I believe if you can't win a war, don't go into it. Mm -hmm. Just like we went into Libya. We had no reason to go into Libya. We don't know if these people are going to be a democracy or if they're going to be just as bad as the Al-Qaeda, the ones that take over. Right. Okay. Right? Not that I favored Gaddafi, don't get me wrong. He, uh -huh. was, he, was, he was no good uh -huh. any more than Saddam was any good or, or, uh, or bin Laden. Right. But... You go into, you, you're given millions and millions and millions of dollars to a bunch of people who are rev, re, revolting against Gaddafi, and you don't know who they are. Mm -hmm. And that's my opinion on that. Okay. Uh, did, you, did you join any veterans organizations? Oh, yes. I belong to the American Legion, mm -hmm. disabled American veterans, ex prisoners of war. That's about it. Okay. Um, do you attend any other reunions? I guess you do, huh? I did twice. I attended the XPOW reunion okay. a couple of times. My friend lived in Las Vegas after after he moved out of New York. Right. And there was a, there was a reunion many years ago, XPOWs. But as far as reunions now, the division I was with doesn't have any more because everybody is. You see, there were 134,000 POWs in World okay. War II. Mm -hmm. There's only about 20-some thousand of us left. Uh -huh. I don't know anybody. Okay. You know what I'm saying? I understand. So, that's about it. You feel like there's anything else that we need to cover that we haven't covered? Concerning my, my uh, activities in the war? I don't think so. I think I've covered it all. I, I just... I, I just... I love this country. I want to tell you, I'm, I'm telling you this with my heart. I love this country, but now, what's happening in the last few years, I see the country going to hell. I would never go into the, into the service again today. Mm -hmm. and, I'm, and I hate to hear myself say this, but the things that are happening is just beyond my understanding. And I don't want to bring politics into it, but I'm not a right winger and I'm not a left winger, but our country is not being run the way it should be run today. That's my opinion. We can't keep spending money if we don't have any, any more than you can run a house if you can't pay for it. Right. So that's my opinion. And that's about it. All right, Lennon, well, I'm going to thank you very much. For your time. I, I thank you, girl. Okay, and really appreciate you coming and spending yeah. the time to help us get this done. And where does all this information go?